Join me now to discuss this and preview a bit of what we will cover tonight here at the Pray Vote Stand Town Hall Meeting are three of tonight's guest speakers. Joining me is former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman. She's now the Dean of the Robertson School of Government at Regent University. Dr. Stephen Coughlin, he is Principal at uh, Unconstrained Analytics. And Dr. Mark David Hall, he is author and professor at George Fox University. Uh, lady and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> to Washington Watch. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Dr. Hall, let me start with you. Um, the term Christian nationalism, everybody seems to be using it, but what does it mean? You know, that's a great question. Thank you for that. And I, this is not a scientific way to explore the question, but if you do a Google Ingram search, you will see that almost no one is using Christian nationalism prior to 2006. No Christian is going around saying, I am a Christian nationalist. No one's saying we should promote Christian nationalism. It, it begins being popular in 2006 when critics start using it as a label to label Christians who bring their faith into the public square for ends they don't like. Now, these, cri these critics of Christian nationalism, initially, they're all popular authors. They're not academics, by and large. They work for places like the Freedom From Religion Foundation. So that should oh, suggest yeah, nice there's groups. an agenda at, at work yeah. here. And so you have this criticism after criticism of these horrible Christians who want to bring about a theocracy and oppress women and African Americans and all racial minorities. And it's just hor a, a horrible, toxic thing that no one would want to be associated with. Right. It, to me, that sounds like political warfare. Um, Stephen, what, 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 what's driving this? What are they using it for? Well, to pick up on a line you brought up earlier, I think they actually did decide they were going to uh, target uh, uh, pa normally patriotic Christian Americans. And what they did was they created a faux term, Christian nationalism, and they gave it all these negative attributes and then used that to attack Christians. It's part of what you call an intersectional line of attack in a political warfare model, which is the Maoist insurgency model, which we believe is the premier principal form well, of Marxism. That would, well, and that's what's driving the left today. I mean, we've, I've watched this. Michelle, I know you have as well. In my 20 years here at the Family Research Council, we went from having liberals like Chris Matthews. I used to go on hardball and debate him all the time. You don't see conservatives going on MSNBC uh, because they're not liberals. They're leftists, and they don't want to have a discussion. And, and, Michelle, a lot of this is about political elections. I mean, what's, I mean, why all of a sudden this intense focus on Christian nationalism right before an extremely important midterm election? Because it all comes about holding on to power. That's what it's about. There's only one party par power now in the United States, in Washington, D.C. They don't want to let it go. That's it. Bottom line, they want to hold on to power. And what they have seen is the power of the church the epicenter of power in the United States opposing their agenda is the church and the principles of the Bible. They don't like pastors preaching on issues. They don't like congregants being inspired from the Bible. And so that's why we're the target. They want to silence us. So this isn't some big academic thing. And Mark David Hall, Dr. Hall, is going to be talking about the research and how phony baloney a lot of the research is on this topic out there. But it's all designed to give a veneer of credibility that what they're saying is true. And I think what we're going to be demonstrating tonight, what they're saying is hogwash. And so we need to not be intimidated as believers. We need to pray, vote, stand. And having done all, stand. I think I've heard you say yes, that. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> it works, doesn't it? Uh, Dr. Hall, I want to ask you this question, going back to kind of the definition, because I've, uh, I'm used to the, to the left's tactics, the Marxist tactics of labeling to the purpose. I mean, this actually goes back to the rules for radicals. They do the same yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at like what happened just recently, about two weeks ago in Pennsylvania, uh, Doug Mastriano, who is running for governor there, uh, called upon his supporters to pray and fast for 40 yeah. days. Yeah. Now, yeah. I've been a part of a lot of prayer yeah. and fasting yeah. events. In fact, even when I was in office and a candidate, I did the same thing. Well, the media, some of the media, responded immediately saying, evidence that he is a Christian nationalist. Well, that would actually put a lot of the leaders in the history of this country into the category of Christian nationalist. 
Throughout American history, Christians at their best have brought their faith into the public square to fight for liberty and justice for all, in creating just colonial laws, in opposing slavery, in promoting civil rights. I mean, think about the right. leaders of the civil right. rights movement, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young, on and on they do. Now, what goes on here is a, is a bit of labeling, because even the critics, even the better academic critics of Christian nationalism will, will say it's perfectly fine for the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. to bring his faith into the public square to advocate for civil rights. But if you dare to bring your faith in the public square to oppose abortion, or to argue for a conception of religious liberty that goes beyond freedom of worship, you're a sexist or a bigot. That's an evil sort of Christian nationalism that yeah. must be oppressed. I throw this out for anyone. Uh, my observation is that the intensity of this began to ramp up over the issue of human sexuality. When the redefinition of marriage came, then there seemed to be have to be a clear line made, and anyone who dare take on that issue had to be eliminated, had to be silenced. And I think that's where we've really seen the intensity of this, because these things for people who actually believe the Bible, they're non-negotiable. It's not, it's not our truth. It's God's truth. And we have to, as I was just talking with Pastor Gary, we have to come in alignment with the Word. We don't make the Word of God come in alignment with us. What I think, especially on this issue with sexuality of a genderless society, that's the move right now. We're going to have a genderless society, and you make up your own truth. This is the ultimate fabrication of truth, yeah. is to make up what your human sexuality is. So that is so bizarre, so over the top. We've never seen this kind of a conversation before. And so for that reason, they need to make us look like we're the oddballs. This is weird. This is bizarre to say that we're a genderless society. And so for us talking about what has been normative for 5,000 years of human history, they ha they're working overtime to make us look like we're the bizarre ones. Right. I, I want to go to the issue of this is creating a void and a vacuum in chaos. Something always fills that. In your study of Marxism and your study of uh, essentially political warfare, where does this lead? Well, I think what we're seeing right now is a phrase that is popular in my circle. It's called liquefying reality, where they're at the point of a demoralization campaign where people can no longer understand. They're happy that people who want to talk about genderless society will do it. What they really call the victory is people who know it's not true and will still say it the demand that two plus two equals five. And that's the imposition of will on people. So was, was COVID a test of that concept where we just see people falling in line like lemmings? Well, we actually put something out warning. We got to the National Security Council warning that the narrative on COVID was completely severable from COVID itself. And within the narrative on COVID, it enforced what we call Marxist mass line enforcement narratives. And the word mass line comes from Mao. And that right down the line, we were able to call the election a year ahead. We had something out that it was the whole radical summer was going to start in Minnesota before that thing was started because we could we can, we can see what they're saying, and we can see where they're going, and we can forecast what they're doing. They're that predictable, but we have to make a decision to put aside our college-educated, ed taught political science narratives, which I think are designed to create a scientific language or pseudoscientific language that overwrites what people are seeing and redefine it. So were you encouraged at all by, it, it took a little while to get some traction, but there was some strong pushback to and I'm talking about COVID in particular because I do think that was kind of a test run for the left. There was a lot of pushback against that, and it tells me that our society as a whole has not picked up and is not waving the white flag. I don't think people have given up at all. I think people have to remember that what's going on right now is Republicans have won the election on the issue that is what the what people here come to, come to vote for. It's the people we elect who will not execute that when it happens, when they win, even if they win big. So I don't think it's a problem of the masses. I get to Minnesota, my mother-in-law died, she's from Minnesota. If you went one step outside of Minneapolis, all you saw was Trump flags. It's all you saw. And the, I am one of those people who wonders whether Allison ever won that election. And I think that that might want to be one of those states where that was an early... So you're a denier. Well, I am a... No, no, I'm just picking. Yes. That's another one. Of, that's a little, you don't, you haven't been around me enough, so you, don't, you didn't pick up on that. that that's, the, the, that's the labeling. 
absolutely. That's the labeling. But that's because then of, you I think that's part of the confusion campaign. And I think the I think Romans one really speaks to this. The fact that we are swimming in a sea of lies right now in America and have been through COVID. Right. I think that's what you're talking about. That's a test run for right. lies where you lie and lie and lie to people and once you believe the lie and you spout the lie yourself then you move into delusion. Right. That's what the scripture says. So that's, we have a lot of cognitive dissonance within the church, I think, even. You're, you're absolutely right. I think it goes back to the issue of the lack of courage when you know the truth, but you're afraid to say the truth. And that's where pastors come in. That's where pastors and the church come in because you need to put a stake in the ground for what truth is and not deviate it. And so we have to keep our heads about us as believers, right. I think. Well, and, and going back, and, I, you know, again, I was picking on that issue of the election, but there's a lot of evidence out there to show that there was a manipulation of the election process, whether it would be the, the boxes that Mark Zuckerberg you know, put in, uh, but there's there's legitimate questions to be raised, and in a republic such as ours, you have to be free to you ask questions to, and, and answer. And, and Regent University was the first university that did an election integrity seminar to question what just right. happened in 2020. So if anyone wants to see it, it's regent.edu forward slash election integrity. It's fantastic. It is seven hours of evidence immediately out of the gate where people came in and gave affidavits and all the rest about the fact that things weren't kosher on this election. And remember, that's when people were being thrown off Twitter. Right. They were thrown right, off right. Facebook. They were losing their jobs, if you remember, if you questioned. If you reframe how to look at that election, and, I, and we did reframe it before the election to say that the Marxist left was going to use the uh, a critical race theory, which is critical race, which is Marxism, to delegitimize the election. The fact remains that no matter what you personally think about that election, when you can show, I think now a majority of people have questions about that election. The very fact that the elected people will not do a real right. investigation is itself the actual victory, the delegitimization of the electoral process in the face of a public who knows something's wrong. So what do you do when you have the media that buys that and goes along with that and so that... The, the, the platforms by which we use to have these conversations as a nation are basically, as you said, shut off, Michelle, mm -hmm. when you have Twitter, Facebook removing people. So what happens at that point? Well, I think Christian nationalism is a part of that because I think that it is a national smear campaign so that we are quiet, so that we self-censor, right. so we don't speak to keep the church silent. If the church silent is silent, the left wins, the progressive wins, Satan wins if the church is silent. And that's why we have to keep our heads about us and tell the truth. Stephen, isn't there a danger though where there's this repression of half the population and they're marginalized? Isn't there a danger that there could be an eruption of anger? And, and I mean, I, I think this is just a very dangerous place for a republic to be in. I think it's very dangerous. You know, we, we argue that what you see going on in America is a replay of the Weimar Republic in certain respects where they, they tried to correct all right. the errors they made in the Weimar Republic, and they're trying to keep a cap on some of these narratives attack, attacking people who they see as possibly becoming problems ahead of time and intimidating them into silence. But they're playing a game with violence, and, and you know, it's to the people running this, I would say when you're, it, it doesn't matter if you're riding on the back of a tiger, that tiger sometimes rides you and sometimes you ride the tiger. Yeah. So. And Dr. Mark David Hall is from Portland, Oregon, where he Another saw it nice firsthand, spot. Antifa. Yeah. Black from outside of Portland, thankfully, yeah. yeah. No, Portland's just a, it's a war zone. It's a disaster and businesses and people are fleeing if they're at all able to do so. Mm -hmm. All right. You know what? We could do a town hall meeting on this. There's so much to talk about. Brilliant idea. Once again. Well, and it's coming up soon, folks.